We've been in uh, a journey in the Gospel of John from chapter 13 to 17 called the Upper Room. And it's called the Upper Room because Jesus was physically in an upper room with his disciples. And we started as Jesus began to share a meal with his disciples in the Upper Room. And we learned a few things. And I want to just take us uh, sort of like a 30,000 uh, foot uh, uh, review of where we have been. We looked at the reality that greatness, when we think about greatness... Greatness is found in humility and service because Jesus chose to lead with a towel and not a title, right? He could have led with a title, uh, Lord, King, creator of the universe, and yet he chose to wrap a towel around his waist and to clean the feet of even the one who was about to betray him. And we could spend all the rest of our life there, right? But we spent one week there. Uh, we looked at the reality that our missional success, if we are going to be a witness to Jesus, then uh, that's going to depend on the love that we have for one another. We looked at the reality that if we want to know who God is, if we want to know who God is, we, we, we just came out of a series in the book of Ecclesiastes that basically tells us that we can't know who God is, right? Unless there's divine revelation. Uh, if we want to know who God is, we get to look at Jesus. That when we, when we see Jesus, we see God. When we hear Jesus speak in scripture, we're hearing God's heart. So when we see Jesus, we see God, we learned that our obedience is not an option for a disciple of Jesus. That obedience is actually the way in which we express our love for God and for others. We learned that we are invited to remain in him, to make our home in Jesus. We, we learned, I, I was particularly blown away by the week where we spoke about Jesus calling us friends. That uh, I, I, I no longer call you servants, he, he tells his disciples, but I call you friends because I have told you what I'm doing. And then we learned that because the world hated Jesus, it is going to hate you too if you follow him. And over and over again, we, there's been a couple themes throughout the series where, where I've, I've, um, I've pleaded with us to reckon in our souls with the reality that we are addicted to being liked and how that, that very thing, our, our addiction to being liked is detrimental to our walk with Christ. We learned that it's going to be actually better for us to be without Jesus than with him, which is weird to think, right? Uh, that it's actually better to be without Jesus. Jesus himself says, it is to your advantage that I go away, because if I don't go away, then I can't send the Spirit. And we have to reckon with the reality that oftentimes I would much rather a physical Jesus next to me rather than the Spirit of Jesus within me. And then we had a couple uh, guests, James Wong and James Ayer. They led us through the reality that, that uh, um, we are never promised a carefree life. And this is difficult, right? It's difficult when it's one thing to say it. It's one thing to know that trouble will come. Uh, it's like getting an invoice, right? Knowing, hey, I know I have to pay this, but then the money comes out of your account and that's when it hurts. It's easy for us to sit here together and say, yes, we're not promised a, a carefree life. Yes, troubles will come. It's, it's easy to say that. But when troubles come, when that diagnosis comes to us, when that accident happens, when that unforeseen loss happens, what happens to us? We learn that, that God doesn't promise us that we would be spared from those things. He does promise us that we would be protected in them. And we learn that Eternal life is knowing God. And last week, we learned that in order for us to be any good for the world, if we are going to be change agents in the world, if we are going to affect the world in a positive way, that we must be different from the world. Uh, Jesus' call for us was uh, uh, to, be, to remain in the world, but to be not of the world. That we are to be distinct from the world for the sake of the world. And today we're going to close off our series as Jesus closes with him praying that we would be united, that we would be one. He says something as ridiculous as this, that we would be one even as he and the Father are one. And so uh, I remember as, as we get into this, I remember in 2015, 2016 or so, um, I had a full semester where I had to attend Greek classes from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. after a full day of back breaking work. I hated Greek class. Forgive me for all you nerds out there, but I couldn't stand 
uh, having to learn about declensions and nouns and vowels after a full day of work at 8.30 p.m. on a Monday. I could not think of anything worse. And one thing that you realize if you've ever learned a, a new language or, or sort of a new skill is that the key to learning is repetition, repetition, repetition. The key to learning is repetition, repetition, repetition. The key to learning is repetition. Now, you're not going to remember anything I said. You're going to leave like, oh, the key to learning is repetition. But you get the point. And Jesus and the authors of Scripture, they know this. They know that the key to learning is repetition, repetition, repetition. And in these short seven verses that I read earlier, there's going to be one very clear theme that Jesus repeats over and over and over again. He chose to record three times what Jesus' central concern for us as he closes out this prayer. And it's for us to be one. In other words, it's for us to be united as a people. Three times in seven verses, in the first three verses, he mentions that he wants us to pursue unity. And so I want to keep it short and sweet today and walk through a few points here. One, what unity isn't. If you're taking notes, what unity isn't. What unity is. What is the purpose of unity and how unity is achieved. What unity isn't, what it is, what is the purpose, and how it is achieved. Now, the first thing we need to say about what unity is, is what it isn't, right? When we hear the word unity, we think of uh, the reality of uniformity. We think uniformity, we think um, that unity means that we do not celebrate our differences and that unity eliminates our diversity. So when we think about unity, we need to understand that I'm not speaking of unity. Uniformity, okay? I'm speaking of a whole different reality. Unity does not deny the beautiful differences that are a part of us. Unity does not mean that we must look the same or speak the same or occupy even the same socioeconomic networks as one another. And it also doesn't mean that we are going to agree with one another theologically on everything. Now, I know that feels weird for me to say up here as a pastor, but there is room for theological differences at this church. We, we get that. There are, there are spectrums of belief. We're not all going to agree on every article of faith that is handed down to us. Now, there are central doctrines. Don't get, me, don't get it twisted. We, like, Jesus is not a fairy godmother, right? Uh, Jesus is central to who and what we are. The fact that Jesus uh, was born and the fact that he lived the life he lived and that he died the death he died and resurrected and ascended to heaven and is seated on the throne and is promised to come back. These things are central to what we believe and we can't follow Jesus without believing those things. Nevertheless, there is so much where we do not have to agree on, where we in this room I know do not agree on because I've spoken to you about it. Unity does not mean uniformity. It does not mean that our personalities are collapsed into one another and that we lose our distinctiveness and our idiosyncrasies. The more and and the more, it's more than just having room for our differences also. It's also celebrating and highlighting our differences. My favorite book of the Bible, if, if I had to choose... If somehow something happened and uh, in Australia there's massive persecution and I get to choose just one book of the Bible, I can't keep the whole of scriptures. If there's one book that I'm going to keep, it's the book of Revelation. And it says this in the book of Revelation chapter 7, verse 9. It says this, after I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands. I want you to just transport yourself there for just a moment. I want everyone, if you can, if you feel comfortable to do so, just to close your eyes for just a moment. Indulge me. After this, I looked and behold a great multitude that no one could number. From every nation, all tribes and peoples and languages standing before the throne and before the Lamb. And what were they doing? What were they crying out? Verse 10, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You can open in your eyes before you fall asleep. 
What a vision. I mean, what kind of chaos, what cacophony of chaotic noises would John have been hearing to know all tribes, all tongues, all nations, all languages singing this one song, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. You see, unity does not mean that our diversity is diminished. In fact, it's, it's highlighted, it's, it's accented. We do not erase our diversity in order to display a unity in the kingdom of God. Unity is not conformity, conformity and it's not uniformity. It's not flattening out of who you are, your personality, your giftings, your preferences even. And so if that's what unity isn't, what is it? I want to say this, that unity is the joining together of two or more people for a common purpose or goal despite differences. Now, unity is the joining together of two or more people for a common purpose or goal despite their differences. And Jesus, three times, as I mentioned earlier, is going to pray in this text that we would be one, that we would be unified. Come back with me to verse 20. He says this, I do not ask for these only, meaning the, 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 the 12 or the 11, because Judas has gone out to, uh, to betray him at this point. He's not just praying just for them at this point. He's saying, this is for all of us. This is for you and for me. This is what he's praying for us. For those who will believe in me through their word, verse 21, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one. And again, in verse 23, in the beginning, he says, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfectly one. Again, repetition, repetition, repetition. Jesus wants to impress something upon us. He wants to impress how important it is that we pursue unity. And it's to be the kind of unity that mimics the unity of the Father and the Son. Like, bro, let that sink in. Let that sink in for just a moment. He's looking at us. He knows us. He knows our frame. He knows that we are but dust. He knows that we are sinful. He knows that we are broken. And yet he looks at us, and this is what he prays. The unity that I have with the Father. Perfect unity for all of eternity past. He says, I want them, I want you to be like that. And the Father is not the Son. The Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is not the Father. They are differentiated. They are persons. They are three persons in one God, living in perfect harmony and unity. And when Jesus thinks about us, when he thinks about his church, he says, look at the community that is God and be like that. That is wildly impossible. Right, because I know me. That is wildly impossible because I know you, right? And I know the mess that even is in this small community. Like, I, I know. It's wild that Jesus is going to sit there and pray and say, I want you to be united. I want you to be one just as I am one with the Father. This is what I am praying for you. How wonderful and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity, the psalmist writes in Psalm one. 33. Paul urges us in the book of Ephesians to walk in a manner worthy of our calling, to be eager to maintain the what? The unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. We're called to pursue and to maintain a unity that is not born out of our natural similarities. That's easy to do. There are clubs everywhere. I'm on a Facebook page with 3,000 irate New York Knicks fans. That's the only thing, trust me, that I have in common with these people. It's easy. It's easy to bond around suffering like being a Knicks fan, right? It's easy to do that. It's easy to bond with people who are in your similar life stage. It's easy to do that. It's easy to bond with people who, who look like you and who speak like you. But our unity is not displayed just in the ways that we are similar in the natural realm. Jesus is calling us to something wholly different and supernatural. We don't need supernatural power to like people who are likable, right? Who, people who live in the same postcode. That's easy. We're on call to live in unity simply with those who are like us. There's no uh, need for gospel power in that. 
Our unity displays the wonderful and the beautiful and the complex tapestry that, listen, it calls into question the way the world sees community, the way the world sees being united. Our unity isn't based upon where we were born, on our likes, our dislikes, the shade of the skin of our color. Our unity is based on the reality, listen, our unity is based on the reality that we have become a new humanity in Christ. Get that. That's founda- That's 101 for us. That our unity is based on the reality that we have become the new humanity in Christ. Jesus is the focal point, the very foundation and the reason for our unity. It's the gospel that joins us together. The gospel is our purpose. It is the glue of this community. It's it's seeing the power of the gospel being embedded here in real ways where we can actually put up with people we don't like. We are a community because we've been made a community. We've been called into the gospel, into the true story of what God has done in Christ to defeat death and Satan and sin and evil in history, in time, and in space. And so I want to say this, that unity is not uniformity. It is not the flattening out of our God-given differences and distinctions. Unity is the coming together for a common goal or purpose despite despite our God-given differences and distinctions. And it's a unity that has a force. It has a direction. It has a goal. It has a purpose. Jesus gives us a dual purpose for our unity in verse 23. I want to read that for us again. He says this, I in them, right, that's us, I in them and you in me, that they may be perfectly one. Why? Why? What's the purpose of our unity? So that the world may know that you sent me and loved them even as you have loved me. I want us to understand the staggering reality that we have all been drawn into by grace. If you've decided to follow Jesus in this room, this is what's true about you. This is not something that we get to decide. This isn't just like the terms and conditions. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That our unity is not just for us. Our unity is not just about us. Even even when we benefit greatly, both socially and psychologically, when we live in peace with one another. That's, that's an offshoot of it. Absolutely. We benefit from our unity, but it's not for us, and it is not even ultimately about us. Our unity, it confirms two things that I want you to hear. It confirms two things, that Jesus is who he said he is, and that God loves the world. That is what our unity shows. That is what our unity is Four, it is crazy. It is absolutely staggering. It is astonishing, astounding, stupefying, incredible, mind-boggling. Right-click, synonym. Insert there. It's crazy to think that Jesus would leave it up to you and to me, up to us, to be his co-signers on whether he's legit or not. That's wild. It's wild that he would call us to that, that he would leave us as his co-signer. So this is what Jesus says, I bet. If you, he's speaking to the world. If you, the world, the unbelieving world, if you want to know whether I'm legit or not, go to the church. They're united. It's proof that I'm legit, that I am who I am. If you want to know if I love the world, go to the church If they're united, proves that I love the world. That's wild. Like, I'm not, it's astounding that our unity confirms these two things, that Jesus is who he said he is and that God loves the world. But in the same way that our unity confirms that Jesus is who he says he is and that God loves the world, what does our disunity do? I used to be... This is, this is confession time. I used to be so judgmental of people 
who walked away from the church because they were hurt by the church or because they saw chaos in the church or, 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 or uh, you know, they were disillusioned by the church. I would say things in my, in my heart and in my mind like, come on, man. Like, just go straight to Jesus. But Jesus here is saying, no, go, go, go to the church. They will prove with their love, with their unity, whether or not I am legit or not. And there's something to say about going directly to Jesus. But this text is saying to us today that we, me, I, am somewhat responsible for the unbelief in the world. Me, my own disunity, my own, the, the own ways that I've allowed disunity to take root in communities. And that's hard. It makes us responsible, not only for our own faith, but it, it makes us responsible for the faith or the lack of faith thereof in those around us. We pursue unity so that the world would know that Jesus is who he said he is. We pursue unity so that the world would know that God loves them because in the end, unity is about love and mission, right? This is nothing new. I got one record to play and it's all remixes. One record. I'm only ever gonna preach like really, maybe two sermons and one of them, is that our whole, we exist for love and mission. We don't exist for ourselves. And that's why we must guard against the disunity in the body. This is why we pursue emotional health so that we would be able to have the tools to deal with conflict in a healthy way. This is about grass and dirt. This is about blood and bone. This touches our lives. This doesn't just sit somewhere up in the ether. This is about how we interact with one another. That's why it's so important to root out from now unhealthy and sinful patterns in this community. This is why last week I said this, that we can be persecuted from the outside and that will only serve to strengthen the church. You can bring all of hell against the church and it will somehow, in God's wisdom, only serve to strengthen the church. But you let gossip run rampant in this community you let bitter judgmentalism run amok here. You let coercive and angry leadership take over and set the culture and pace for this church. We sweep conflict under the rug. We allow the enemy to sow discord among us. That will be a cancer that will eat away at this community from within. All of hell can come against us. And Jesus says, nothing, like that's not going to destroy the church. But I tell you what will, backbiting will. Speaking about one another in a way that passes as prayer points will. Like, let me, let me tell you what. Let's pray for the sister. Right? Man, she's struggling. Let me tell you how she's struggling. Gossip is a much greater enemy to the health of this community than anything that, that can come up against it from the outside. Our unity is that important. Our unity is that important that we are willing to have that awkward and difficult conversation. We're willing to sort out our issues with one another because our unity is that important. Our unity is not about flattening our differences. It's about coming together for a common purpose and goal because it confirms whether Jesus is who he said he is and that God loves the world. But how do we, how do we then get there? Simply put, the unity that we're after is actually not a, a unity that we can achieve. We are invited to partner with God to maintain the unity that he has gifted us. We, we're gifted unity. And we're called to maintain that unity. We're called to pursue and maintain a gospel unity because a unity that is based on anything else is going to devolve into cliques and judgmentalism. If we decide to unify under anything else but the gospel, it will devolve into judgmentalism and cliques. Anything else, even a really good thing, like a, like a theological banner, anything else, we will devolve. Even if, we, even if our main purpose and goal is to come together and say we are a church that plants Churches, man, well, we're going to judge those churches that don't plant churches. It doesn't matter what it is. Anything besides the grace that we have received 
from Christ. Anything else will devolve into judgmentalism and clicks because the gospel, the good news that there is a new king on the throne who has forgiven my sin and my trespasses, which are many. The king who has absorbed the wrath of God on our behalf. He breaks down the wall of superiority. There, if, if we, listen, all of our lives, everything about us, everything about the human condition, we, we try to grab onto anything and make that our our reason. It becomes our justifying thing in our life. And so it could be our children. It could be our church. It, 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 it could be our jobs. It, it could be anything, anything, any good thing or bad thing, but we can take anything and put it at the center of our lives and say, this is what makes me right. This is what makes me good. This is what makes me worthy. The gospel says there is nothing under the sun that can give you that. Nothing. But it can be gifted to you. It's not our own righteousness. It's a righteousness that has been gifted to us. Because I want to remind you something, about, uh, uh, something I said a year ago. Is that the gospel is not just about your relationship with God. Okay? The gospel does not just tear down the wall of alienation that existed between you and God. The gospel tears down the wall of alienation that exists between us and us. The gospel is about our social reality as well with one another. The gospel says that there's nothing that I have done that can make me even an iota better than anyone else. It demolishes the idea that my difference makes me better than yours. And what the gospel does, it doesn't demolish our differences, but it does relativize them. So they no longer need to be the deepest and the truest thing about us. All of the realities and all of the categories that we use to define ourselves are no longer the deepest and the truest things about us because the gospel joins us together. The, the fact that I am a man matters, okay? The fact that I am Puerto Rican matters, right? The fact that I am American, Australian matters, the fact that I'm a father and a husband, it matters. The fact that I'm a pastor matters. But all of those things, if I go to those things to find my identity and my security, then how easy will it be for me to judge those who don't do that or don't do that as well as I do? I can begin to use all of those things that I listed and more to justify myself, but I'm not made right by anything that I am or accomplish or do. Rather, the gospel says this, a gift of the gospel, a, a consequence of the gospel says that I am made right. I am counted as enough based on the finished work of the new king. That's what joins us together. I couldn't imagine in any other universe that a group like us would end up in a room together for the sake of it. There, there are just too many differences here. Like, there are just some things that I like that you don't and you like that I definitely don't, right? Like, we just, we're just different, and that's beautiful. I couldn't imagine us all being in the same room for any other reason that we worship a dead and rising Messiah. I, I couldn't imagine it. When that, when the gospel becomes the thing that joins us together, when that becomes our purpose, when that becomes the heaviest thing in each and every one of us, what will naturally begin to happen? The same thing that happens in physics. When, 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 we are, when something is the heaviest, it has the, a greater gravitational pull. And what happens? Things are drawn in. And as the gospel, as the glory of Jesus becomes the heaviest thing about us, we will get closer and closer and closer and closer, and as we are drawn into the glory of the gospel, the heaviness of the gospel, the beauty of the gospel, we're being drawn into one another. We begin to experience the gift of unity. And as we begin to enjoy the gift of unity, I'm going to invite the band up as I finish up. The gift of unity that the gospel gives us, what begins to happen through us? The world will see and will know that Jesus is who he said he was. 
and the world will begin to know that God has loved them even as he has loved his own son. And my question, this is an honest, listen, this is an, I don't, I never want to be up here and ask questions uh, uh, simply rhetoric, like rhetorically. Not that you need to answer, but I really want you to answer for yourself. Who doesn't want to be a part of that in this room? Who doesn't want to be called into what God is doing to renew the universe? And so my call to us here, believer or not, male, female, ethnicity, this or other, is to press into the gospel, to think about the gospel, to meditate on the gospel, to cherish the gospel, to rejoice in your salvation. And as you do that, to allow that to be the heaviest thing about you, the truest thing about you. And as you are drawn into the glory of the sun, may we become the type of community that brightly shines the light of Jesus. That Jesus is who he said he is. That God loves the world with the same ferocity, the same power, the same strength that he loves his only begotten son. Let me pray for us. Father, we thank you. We thank you that none of this comes from us. None of this comes from our power. None of this comes from our strength. None of this comes from us. This is wholly alien. There is nothing that we've done to deserve this. There is nothing that we've done to preempt this. There is nothing that we have done to even guided in this way it is all grace it is all gift and so Holy Spirit I pray now that if there is a, a spirit a sense a feeling of superiority in this room Lord would you bring that to the cross may we crucify that If there's any sense that we are worthless, may we bring that to the cross and crucify that. Holy Spirit, we need you. We need you to be one. There is there's just too much funk in us for us to do this in our own strength. And so I pray that you would purify this community, Lord that you would go before us, that you would help us to see that there's nothing that we can do, nothing that we need to earn. The cross is not something that we earn. The cross isn't even something that has changed your mind, God. The cross is an expression of the love that you've already had for the world. And so help us to just relax and to cherish and to meditate and to allow ourselves to be changed by the gospel that we too, Lord, would be agents and conduits of your beauty, of your love, of your renewal. We can't do this, but you can. And so we pray that you do so now. And we pray for all these things in Jesus' holy name. And the church said, amen.